Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Zykis, I, Ankit Agarwal, would like to welcome you for today's webinar on securing the future of procurement. Uh, we have two esteemed speakers today, Peter Smith and Sp uh, Richard Wolf. Peter Smith is man managing editor at Spend Matters Zero, which now covers three leading procurement websites, Spend Matters UK, Spend Matters Netherlands, and new public sector Spend Matters Europe. Peter is a visiting faculty at University of Birmingham and has co-authored book on buying professional services. Our next speaker, Richard Walk, he is a VP Corporate Development at Zyke Inc. Richard has an extensive background in B2B e-commerce. He's helped launch uh, GE's Trading Process Network, the first online marketplace for sourcing and procurement. He was also co-founder of B2E Markets, one of the first SaaS sourcing suite providers and later covered the supply management market as an industry analyst for the Everdeen Group. Before we move on to the presentation, you know, we, we would just like to uh, share some information at any given point in time. If you have any questions, feel free to write and post them on the chat box on your right hand side. Uh, if, you, if you have any difficulties while, uh, uh, you know, uh, listening to the webinar, we will even, we'll be even sending you the link to the archive link to the webinar. Uh, I now pass on the button to Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Um, good afternoon, everybody, if you're in the same part of the world as me, uh, which is a rather chilly southeast of England. Um, good morning if you're, if you're somewhere else, or good evening if you're somewhere else. Um, so Ankit gave you a bit of introduction uh, about me, but um, I started some 30 years ago, my goodness, what a long time that is, uh, in procurement as a, a young manager buying raw materials at Mars Confectionery. Um, I was then procurement director for the Dun & Bradstreet Corporation Europe, a, a very large UK government department. Uh, and then I was the last ever procurement director for the NatWest Banking Group before we got uh, taken over by Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, I'm also an ex-SIPS president, uh, was mainly consulting through the noughties, um, and then somehow got into this uh, this strange life of writing and analyzing and thinking about procurement, which is, um, which is what I mainly, mainly do now. Um, and uh, hopefully a lot of you will know Spend Matters. Uh, as Ankit said, we launched Spend Matters UK Europe about four years ago, just over four years ago now. Um, and we, we now have sort of thousands of readers a day there. Uh, we write about all aspects of procurement. That, that site is fairly UK focused. Um, so more recently, we launched Public Spend Matters Europe with the aim of really having a proper pan-European focus, but purely looking at public sector government procurement issues. Um, so I've been writing about corruption in Ukraine this morning and um, looking at changes in legislation in different countries, as well as technology and issues like that. So that's, uh, that's enough about me, really. Um, the presentation today really came out of a dinner uh, I spoke out with Zykus back in November in London um, on this same topic. And it was one of those nice occasions where uh, I presented before dinner and then you, you ask, you know, are there any questions and about 25 or 30 fairly senior procurement people in the room. And um, sometimes at these events, you know, it's quite hard to actually get the questions going. And this was one of the nice ones where uh, as soon as I stopped, um, the comments and questions started coming in. We actually had some quite heated debate. Um, I think there were certain people in the room who thought I was talking a, a load of absolute nonsense, to be quite honest. Um, so, so we had we had quite a, a good debate. And it actually got to the point after about uh, sort of 30 or 40 minutes of this debate, we, we actually had to say, well, I, actually, I think the waiters are getting a bit impatient to serve dinner. Um, and then we opened it up again later in the evening. So it seemed to be a, a good topic, uh, hence why we thought we'd we'd pick it up again for this, this webinar. Um, and the topic is uh, securing the future procurement. And it's really about how can we make sure that procurement continues to be as successful as it's been in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so I've been doing it for some time. And I'd love to think procurement success has been purely down to the fact that I joined the profession 30 years ago, but that would, uh, would certainly not be true. So really, there's three parts to, to this, my 15 minutes or so. Um, first of all, to look at why we've been successful uh, in the past, because I think that informs the future. 
Um, secondly, why I don't believe the, the things that have made us successful are going to just continue into the next 10 years. And then a bit about what we as procurement professionals can do to address that. Although, you know, in 15, 20 minutes, I'm not going to get the, the holy grail or the magic solution to all the, the issues facing procurement. But we can start to think, uh, I hope, about, um, about what we might do differently in the future. And if you've got any questions as we go along, please type them into the little box on the bottom corner of your screen, and, and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. So why has procurement succeeded in the last 20 years or so? And, and it's pretty clear that it has by almost any measure you want to look at. So I was president of SIPS 12 years ago now, and I think we had something approaching 30,000 members, between 25 and 30,000 members. There are now over 100,000. Now, quite a lot of those, to be fair, are Chinese students. We didn't have too many of those in 2003. Um, but there's no doubt that around the world, there are simply a lot more procurement professionals. They're better trained and educated than ever before. So 30 years ago, we weren't a graduate profession particularly. Uh, now we very much are, and there's even more and more young people coming in with, with masters, PhDs, you know, MBAs, whatever. Now we haven't got the, the point where there's a procurement director sitting on every board, which is, is a great aspiration for us to have as a profession, but again, there's a lot more procurement people at senior levels uh, than there were even 10 years ago, I think. So if we look at our current SIPS president, um, he's a good example. He's worked his way up through supply chain and procurement roles. He's now CEO, uh, chief executive of a huge oil company in Nigeria. I was doing some research recently, actually, and I, I only, uh, only came across this, this guy again, um, having known him in, in the past, Willie Dees, who was the uh, much respected, quite influential um, CPO of GlaxoSmithKline. And I knew he'd moved to Merck um, two or three years ago, but I didn't know he's now actually vice president on the main board of Merck with responsibility for global manufacturing as well as procurement and some other things. So, so we're seeing procurement people move up generally in the, in the, in the business world. Um, more professionalization, we've talked a bit about that. We're using technology more and better than we ever did in the past. And we have a high public profile. Now that's got positives and negatives. Uh, I've written a bit on the blog recently about some of the, the negative press procurements had, um, whether that's uh, slavery in the supply chain or horse meat um, or people treating their suppliers, but you know, extending payment terms to suppliers and procurement takes, takes the blame for that often. So I guess with the, uh, the growth and success of procurement, there comes a downside in terms of sometimes that public profile. So why has procurement succeeded in the last 20 years? Um, is it because of the inherent genius of our friends and colleagues in the profession? Well, it would be nice to think so, but I don't actually believe that all the smartest people in the world have gone into procurement in the last few years. Uh, I think a lot of them have, but you know, not all of them. Uh, is it that we've had the best education or the best professional institutes? Well, again, I think that's all helped, but I don't think that really explains the sort of growth we, we've had. I think we have to look at external factors. And I think there's been three or four in particular that have really played into the hands of, of, of our profession and have really helped drive that, that growth in procurement. So the first is really just a growing complexity of business and organizations. So if we go back to, to Henry Ford making cars 100 years ago, uh, Ford's theory, theories were around vertical integration. So he actually wanted to own all the, the components, all the elements that went into making his cars. So he was quite famous. He, he went as far as buying steel mills and even, even buying the forests um, from which he could get the wood to make the, the dashboards for the car. Now, now all of that seems totally, <clears throat> excuse me, seems totally crazy now because we've seen a huge boom in, in outsourcing in the last 50 years or so. Um, however we define outsourcing, but really what I'm talking about is firms not doing everything or making everything themselves but using supply markets to provide the, the goods and services that they need to, to make their final products. And that's true of both public and private sector organizations. I don't know, we may, we may well have some 
public sector people on, on the call. Um, public and private organizations are just using third parties, suppliers as we'd call them, for, for so much of their requirements. So of course that means there's more buying and more commercial activity going on, more procurement. You may have seen the, the study from outsourcing firm Proxima, I think it's about 18 months ago now, um, and they looked at the accounts of hundreds of different firms and actually worked out that on average around 70% of those firms' revenues were then being spent with third parties. So in other words, what we might call procurement spend was something like 70% of total company revenues. Uh, now, now, when I you know, used to do presentations for SIPs, we used to talk about that being something around 50%, um, which I think was just a guess, to be honest. But there's no doubt that 70% is higher than it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So again, more procurement work, more for procurement people to do. The, um, so the second, the second point that's, that's helped procurement really is the growth in international trade and what we, we tend to call globalization. So not only are firms spending more with third parties, as we said, as the Proxima study showed, they're spending that on a more global basis. And of course, the world economy has grown. Uh, it doesn't always seem like we're all richer, but the GDP of the world um, has grown, has, has something like doubled over the last 20 years, more than doubled. So there is more money flowing, there is more trade naturally. But that trade has become a lot more international. And with that, that internationalism and globalization comes more complexity. So far more companies now have to think about issues, um, whether it's, it's some of the risk elements in the supply chain, which we'll come on to a bit in a minute, uh, whether it's currency issues, whether it's pure logistics and shipping and so on. So, so that complexity, again, has led to the development of our procurement and supply chain profession as the people who could handle that complexity. So quite a lot of the work we do now, if you go back in time, would have been done by budget holders, business managers in our organizations. But because it's got more complex, that's, that's played into our hands in terms of us being the experts who knew, who know how to do some of those things. So we've got new opportunities, new work areas ranging from currency, looking at risk, reputational risk, ethics, all of those things, logistics management. Um, so the spend under management, the percentage of our organization's spend that's handled by the procurement function has again gone up considerably over the years. And there's some survey, survey results support that. I, I think if you look at some of the spend categories, um, facilities management, property related areas, marketing services, IT, they've gone from 20 years ago where probably less than 50% of organizations saw procurement as having a key role to play in those categories. And now it's up in the sort of 60, 70%. It's by no means 100%, by the way. I mean, you know, not every procurement function in every organization is covering anywhere near 100% of spend, but it's a higher percentage than it was 10, 20 years ago. And finally, we touched on risk there. With, with all the things we've talked about so far, the outsourcing, the globalization, the risk factors have increased as well, whether that's political risk, supply disruption, natural disasters, the reputational risk, in terms of whether it's factories collapsing or slavery in the supply chain or whatever. And that's all put the focus again on us as the procurement profession uh, and as the procurement professional. So it would be lovely to think that our success has purely happened because of the brilliance of our profession and there's some lovely people winning their, their SIP Supply Management Awards uh, in 2013. I think that was probably, um, I'm guessing it was somebody in Scotland. It might have been the Scottish Government. Anyway, uh, I'm afraid it's not. So now we need to move on, having looked backwards and looked to the future. And my hypothesis really is that the trends we've seen in the past uh, cannot and will not continue. Um, changes are inevitable and those trends won't continue in the same way they have in the past. So let's start with outsourcing. And that um, apparently 
ever-increasing percentage of third-party spend going up and up, as Proxima found in their study. Well, it can't go on forever. I mean, just, just mathematically, uh, it, it can't get to 101%. It can't even get to 100%. We're never going to have a totally virtual organization. There's always going to be something that is done within the entity. Now, that doesn't mean the 70% couldn't increase somewhat. We, we could have discussions about do we think it's going to get to 75 or 80 or whatever. Um, but what's clear is we won't see the growth in that that we've seen in previous years. So whether it's gone from 40 or 50 when I started to um, up to 70 now, we're not going to see the same growth in the next 20 years. So that's an inevitability. Globalization is interesting. Um, now this could go either way, but I think there are certainly some signs that again, we're not going to see the same growth uh, in the next 10 years that we've seen in the past. So part of that is just uh, that sense of, well, it's sort of gone in some areas as far as it can. Um, but actually in terms of things like low cost sourcing, we're beginning to see some movements away from that and trends, certainly in some countries, um, towards onshoring, reshoring, nearshoring, all, all these things that basically say, uh, rather than buying everything from the far side of the world, um, we're going to look to do it closer to home. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot less work for procurement, but when we actually come to people potentially uh, taking work back in-house, then obviously that would. So, um, risks, risks again, aren't going to go away, but I suspect we're going to see a lot more from technology um, and automation will start addressing risk management and perhaps again reduce the, the, amount, um, the amount of work for, for procurement fundamentally. Technology in fact is a very, very interesting one and I think it is going to reverse at least in part one of those trends that's helped procurement. So Gilles Brown, Sami Rashid, ex Novartis, CPO, um, call it the democratization of the supply chain. And what they mean is users and budget holders through technology can do work that they couldn't a few years ago that they had to rely on procurement to do. Technology is getting more user friendly, uh, having more functionality but being easier for maybe non-experts to use. Um, so if a user can, can use the internet, or a supply network, can understand the market quickly, run a robust sourcing process using some very intuitive software that guides her through the process, then why does she need procurement to help? The next generation, you know, my daughter's generation, coming into the workforce, much more comfortable using technology. Expect to be able to just pick up and use technology. Why would they wait two months while the procurement function uh, decides whether or not they can run a sourcing event? So I can see users doing more themselves, and inevitably that means work disappearing from procurement. So that all sounds a bit worrying, doesn't it? So uh, less, less spend um, or percentage of spend with third parties not growing, globalization peaking, uh, risks getting better understood, technology allowing colleagues to do things. Um, so what's the role for procurement? Well, I think there still is a role, and the good news is Organizations are not going to stop doing procurement. Um, the, the processes still have to be done. In fact, organizations, if anything, are appreciating more and more uh, that procurement is important. We've seen that. So it's not as if the process or activities are going to disappear, but I think we have to redefine our role. We've already given up a lot of the routine work, particularly in the purchase to pay area over the years. But I think that will go further. A lot of um, relatively low to mid-level sourcing activity, uh, a lot of spend analysis, I think will be automated and the users will be able to access and do things themselves. Um, we'll see finance providing the governance, or they could step in and provide the governance. IT or finance could provide the systems. So what exactly is it that procurement can and still do? Well, there are three areas where uh, I think we can really, really stake our claim. And the key, the key points are really, we have to show that we're adding real value to our organizations. In the private sector, that's shareholder value. In the public sector, slightly more complicated to express it, but it's something, you know, it's a public sector equivalent of shareholder value. Um, now that sounds obvious, 
But actually, not many procurement functions I know are really focused on shareholder value because savings, for a start, is only a pretty small element of how ultimately shareholder value is considered, to be honest. That's another whole presentation, I think, maybe for another day. Um, but we've got to focus on value, and then we've got to work out what it is we can do as a function that actually our users and other functions can't easily do or won't easily do. So here are the three things I, I think we can, we can really focus on. So we can be the center for spend, governance, strategy, policy, process, all those good things, and also critically defining the tools and technologies that will help our organizations create value from supply markets. Because we don't want every bit of our organization going out and buying their own different e-sourcing system, purchase to pay system, God forbid. Um, so someone has to do that, and that seems to me to be a fundamental procurement role. Then somebody has to manage the really key strategic suppliers, um, particularly when they're acting across multiple contracts, multiple parts of the business. Uh, the budget holder is interested in what they're delivering to him or her in that particular contract, but someone has to take an overview. So there's a key role for the CPO and the procurement function. And then having really deep expertise, so not, not the sort of stuff that the user can replicate easily, um, can, can you know, get from a, a basic easy to use sourcing system, but I'm talking about deep expertise in areas like negotiation, market analysis, um, it may be category specific expertise, but something that it's not easy and probably not sensible for the users to develop that, that sort of expertise. And we then can become, um, it's a bit of a cliche these days, but I think it's, it's a good cliche, the trusted advisor to our colleagues, the budget holders, the board, the CFO, the CEO. So that's all from me for now. Um, I think there is a future for procurement. It's not the same as the past. I, and I think we do have to understand that a lot of our success in the last 20 years was not accidental exactly, but driven by external factors that won't repeat in the next 10. So we need to be proactive, get on the front foot, and create that future for, for ourselves and for our profession. Okay, thank you. Peter, we have, Peter, we have questions, uh, two questions for you. Okay, good. Yeah, question number one is, is there any real evidence that reshoring is happening? Uh, uh, the person says he doesn't see much happening in Western Europe. Yeah, it's a good point. I, if I, I, should have, I should have done a bit of uh, uh, a bit more um, analytical research to try and justify some of my statements. I think I think, and uh, Richard may comment on this when when he speaks. But I, I think there's certainly some evidence it's happening in North America. Um, I've seen some articles about various um, buyers, including people like Walmart in retail, um, actually sourcing perhaps less from China and the Far East and more both from US factories and certainly Mexico. So that nearshoring, you know, bringing, bringing work closer to home, even if you don't bring it totally back in house. And I think there's some evidence in Europe that, um, I mean, some of the countries in Eastern Europe have become quite successful centers for, uh, for services, you know, call centers, IT, back office type work um, that maybe would have been done in, in the Far East or, or India and now might be done in, in Poland or Hungary, whatever. So I, I think there's some evidence. I mean, the UK is quite disappointing because we, we haven't seen um, any real pickup in our manufacturing output in the UK, for instance, which if, if you really saw reshoring happening, I guess you would expect to see that. So it's, it's a good question, but um, I think there is a trend, but yeah. Uh, there's one more question. Um, you know, you talk about budget holders taking back responsibility from procurement, but there are a lot of organizations where procurement has never got to grips with some spend categories. So what will happen in those? Yeah, well, I, I think there's two ways it could go. I mean, I think in some organizations there's still a maturity thing where procurement is, is becoming more mature and may still see their influence growing before it declines, if you like. Um, I think in other organizations, you will see people jumping that step and saying, well, okay, we don't, we don't have very good procurement. The, the people in property do their own buying, but rather than getting procurement to take that over, let's increase the skills of the people in, 
property who are doing the buying. Let's put in technology they can use easily and will will improve the organization's procurement performance not by moving that work into the procurement function but by upskilling the professionals in property or in marketing or in IT and, and I am definitely seeing some evidence of that uh, and talking to some of the software firms actually you know they're selling to other parts of the business rather than just procurement um, because they see that they, they want to get better at procurement, but they're not necessarily going to do that by calling in the procurement people. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of different, different routes there. Okay, so um, we may have some more questions at the end, but I'll hand over now to Richard Waugh of Zykus. Um, hopefully I've handed over control of the slides to Richard, and um, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter, and good afternoon, or whatever the case may be for our various attendees. And um, really interesting topic uh, for me to join the discussion on here, the securing the future of procurement. And, um, you know, just kind of picking up on some of the themes you've laid out, Peter, I know you mentioned that a big part of the role for procurement going forward would be defining the technology footprint and embedding process across the organization. So not necessarily always executing uh, every task involved, but building that foundation with a, a consistent, repeatable, controllable uh, technology footprint across the organization. And that's where I'm going to pick up the discussion. Certainly that's an area we focus on at Zykus is, is the technology enabling component of an overall procurement transformation. And recognizing, of course, it's probably equal parts, at least people, process, and technology to make that happen. And what I'm going to go through today is kind of a methodology uh, to enable the, the procurement function to assume that role of uh, being the architects, if you will, of the technology platform. And I'll start with looking at sourcing and procurement process and finding where are the, the value levers across source to pay. The other critical component then is understanding what is the current baseline performance uh, across sourcing and procurement process and bringing into, into bear some, I think, hopeful, hopefully useful benchmarks to say where should I set my target performance? What should my to be process look like, and uh, taking all that into account, how can I build it into an overall business case that's going to justify a return on investment uh, in, the, in the technology enabling uh, that's part of this transformation playbook that I'm going to go through. And I'll finish up with kind of some uh, best practice advice on how to sequence uh, the technology adoption because most organizations won't be able to assimilate all aspects of a full source to pay technology transformation in one fell swoop all at once. They, they need to phase and stage those according to the right priority. And I'll share uh, some, some uh, uh, guidance uh, in terms of best practice in that area as well. So talking about these value levers, first of all, you know, the, the wheel diagram that we use at Zykus looks at sourcing and procurement as kind of a bifurcated uh, function between more strategic and more operational aspects of procurement. So on the strategic side, really looking at spend visibility, strategic sourcing, category management, and so on. Um, and then operational side being the way you then fulfill, you place orders and, and fulfill against those uh, negotiated agreements. So looking across these processes, oftentimes the starting point is spend visibility with spend analytics. And here the goal is to increase spend under management, find and uncover new opportunities to generate incremental savings across the, the, the organization. With that spend visibility then flowing into um, being able to execute that through strategic sourcing and category management. And as regards technology enablement in this space, 
Uh, the technology in and of itself, of course, is not a substitute for rigorous uh, category management strategic sourcing methodology. Simply put, the argument is that the technology will enable much higher throughput, being able to accelerate uh, strategic sourcing execution, conducting a higher volume of more sourcing events more quickly is going to increase the, the, the net present value of those cash flows uh, to the organization. So really uh, increasing uh, the velocity and throughput of the sourcing execution through those tools. Um, the challenge is, you know, with a lot of organizations at that point having negotiated kind of the best total cost agreements, uh, sometimes there, there tends to be sort of a, a let up, a lapse, you know, that now it's somebody else's problem to think about how we drive compliance. And that is changing very rapidly as procurement assumes this role for end-to-end -end, uh, sourcing and procurement, the full life cycle, it has to include driving compliance to those negotiated agreements. So that starts with in the contract management space, making sure that those contracts are visible and available and accessible to end users to drive compliance to the preferred agreement. There's also a view of taking, taking re the responsibility for the life cycle management of the supplier relationship, so supplier management tools that can help get visibility to how many suppliers do we have in, across the enterprise within given categories and geographies? And the simple fact is most organizations have too many suppliers. So rationalizing the supply base to increase the spend with those preferred vendors is really the strategy that uh, the, the procurement and supply management function can drive. And of course, the last critical component to driving compliance is the operational procurement. Uh, getting a handle on the requisition and order process uh, through procure to pay to, to hit on these value levers, reducing or eliminating the incidence of maverick spending or maverick purchasing. This is the high volume transactional area in the business too. So automating to increase the efficiency for PO and invoice processing to drive down the transaction costs. And in the process, potentially uh, increasing, you know, or finding a source of additional savings through prompt payment discounts, through rebates on uh, you know, total spend levels or P card spend, those kinds of things. And bringing it all together is, is a kind of an emerging discipline we call financial savings management. You know, having a, a standardized way of calculating and reporting on savings such that there's a, an audit trail, a, a sign-off by the finance function that documents that savings were actually realized and delivered to the bottom line. So starting with the value levers um, would be the first step in this methodology to say, how am I going to put together a business case and a technology roadmap for driving my transformation. So I'll walk you through um, a process to say, first we have to understand what our current baseline performance is and how we're gonna set targets um, to understand what the potential improvement should be that we're gonna build into our business case justification. And Peter alluded to earlier, uh, oftentimes the starting point is how much spend is currently under management, and that has been increasing uh, in recent years, and that will be key to procurement being able to continue to drive incremental contributions to the business, finding uh, new categories of spend that, that, that they can influence and control, uh, including some of those often elusive categories like legal or marketing, uh, and, and it starts with visibility. So spend under management, uh, first of all, the, the definition uh, starts with spend that's actively sourced or managed by procurement. So applying uh, a category management process to the spend is sort of the prerequisite. And it's not all spend, it's not total spend. The definition here is sourceable spend, so we would exclude 
things that are non-discretionary, such as uh, taxes or charitable contributions and so on. So the standard is never going to be 100% of total spend, but in terms of looking at the at the targets and current benchmarks, got some relevant ones here. The first one from Aberdeen Group, cross industries, best in class is about 80%. And 80 to 85% is generally a good rule of thumb for what should my target be if my goal is to achieve best in class. You also see there is some variability by industry. These um, industry benchmarks come from CAPS, the Center for Advanced Purchasing Studies um, with Arizona State University, and uh, certainly tends to be higher in manufacturing industries and somewhat lower in some of the services sectors like financial services. So maybe important to kind of tweak what your target should be based on the industry, but as a general rule of thumb, we're looking at 80 to 85 percent as the goal. So the next benchmark to look at is of that spend under management, what kind of spend visibility do I have? And not just at the highest level, an overall products segment or family, but at a granular level. And we look at, the, there's, a, there's a diagram here of breaking out spend at those four different levels, segment, family, class, and commodity. So when we talk about having a granular visibility, it's really achieving either the class or commodity level, uh, a three or four digit uh, level of granularity in the UNSPSC taxonomy. So a good data point here from the Gartner Group showed that the top performers have achieved 95% accurate classification at the granular level, that three or four digit level. So being able to take the take spend and often the source systems provide data that's uh, incomplete or cryptic or inaccurate at a line item level, cleansing and enriching that spend data to achieve the kind of 95 percent target of visibility that's going to be enabling uh, the organization to therefore increase spend under management and execute uh, a, from a strategic sourcing and category management standpoint on a much greater proportion of spending. Next, we need a savings target. So as Peter mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the goal here is securing the future of procurement. How do we make it as successful as the past 10 years? And certainly from a savings standpoint, if we look at this data from the Hackett Group, the last 10 years, at least the, the last five of which, has been a very good time to be in procurement. Uh, a lot of that due to macroeconomic factors, uh, quite frankly, looking at sort of a, a worldwide recessionary period has ironically been a boon to the procurement function, a period of price deflation that drove uh, significantly higher savings capture. So if we look at the the high watermark here coming in 2011, where the world-class performers achieved nearly 8% savings, uh, total spend cost savings, that includes both spend cost reduction and avoidance as a percentage of annual spend. And we've started to see that kind of level off and, and actually start to decline as there's a, there's a recovery underway. Certainly the economic picture uh, here where I am in the U.S. may be rosier than in some parts of the world, but we've seen uh, those world-class organizations actually see savings start to level off in the 5 to 6 percent range. Um, they're looking to find additional sources of value contribution. As Peter mentioned, it's not all just about cost reduction. It includes innovation from the supply base, but I think the the takeaway message, too, is very few organizations are in that world class uh, echelon right now. So for 90% 90, 90 of organizations, they're still probably in the 2 to 3% savings realization stage. So opportunity to double or treble 
the current savings level by achieving world-class performance is still a very significant in building the business case. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a big challenge for a lot of organizations is that there, there's this let up, this lapse that occurs once the ink starts to dry or the digital signature, if you will, is, is saved. Uh, on the contract itself, it's not being able to then drive compliance to those uh, centrally negotiated corporate agreements. And here you see uh, a benchmark from the Aberdeen Group that says, the best in class that had about 80% spend under management are able to, to capture most of that through compliance, only a 2% uh, kind of leakage there. But it's dramatically different when you look at the, the other performers in the market, taking just the average performance as an example, only 30% compliance to the centrally negotiated agreement. So that says, uh, by definition, as much as 70% leakage uh, on those agreements. So it's huge area for improvement here and critical to building the business case that says, if you're going to get finance to sign off on these savings, it can't just be what's negotiated a paper savings uh, through the through the, the RFP process and, and the sourcing process to negotiate those agreements. It's can we demonstrate the actual realized savings uh, through a rigorous compliance capability. The other components that drive the overall business case for the technology transformation, we've kind of talked about the hard cost savings elements through, uh, you know, higher negotiated savings and realized savings with compliance. There's also a an efficiency benefit through improved transactional uh, automation. And um, they can tend to be softer benefits, but, but nonetheless real in terms of the efficiency gains. And here we've used some Hackett Group benchmark data again to look at, you know, key transactional metrics such as the cost per PO and the cost per invoice. And you see a dramatic disparity between what top performers are achieving and what the rest of the market overall is able to deliver, the peer group. So for example, the cost of a PO, top performers have that below $5 per transaction, um, you know, uh, an improvement of four to five X over the, the overall peer group that's incurring $18 per PO. Not quite as dramatic, on the invoice cost, uh, but uh, here you see uh, the, the peer group uh, about five and a half dollars per invoice transaction where top performers have shaved that uh, down to about two dollars per invoice. A byproduct of greater efficiency in the PO to invoice cycle, um, the order to payment, if you will, is being able to shrink the, the approval cycle time on invoices and being able to therefore take advantage of additional savings opportunities like early payment discounts. So you can see top performers are dwarfing uh, the overall peer group, outpacing them by dramatic percentage in terms of how much of the total spend uh, is uh, being accessed or accessible to early payment discounts that can increase the savings uh, captured. So that's transactional process efficiency. Some of the other benchmarks to look at, um, somewhat more difficult to quantify, but uh, things like supplier management. What are the goals in the area of supplier management? So you've got a lot of data here from the Hackett Group that actually looks at spend, including uh, direct and indirect and so on. But the most telling statistic to me is looking at overall, how many suppliers do you have for per billion dollars of spent? And if we look at the comparing world-class performers to non-world-class, world-class performers have about, across all spend categories, direct and indirect, about 2,000 suppliers per billion of spent. 
but non-world class, nearly three times as many suppliers, almost 6,000 per billion in spend. So the opportunity to reduce the supply base by as much as two-thirds to achieve world-class status has a ripple effect in terms of overall efficiency of the function. If you're managing fewer suppliers, you're probably doing a better job at it. And, uh, and also being able to then therefore consolidate and leverage spend with your most preferred and strategic suppliers uh, generating incremental savings as well. So just to share with you a couple of other benchmarks that may factor into your business case, uh, one that's gaining traction here, especially as I mentioned for world-class organizations that may see their ability to drive spend cost reduction flattening or diminishing with an overall economic recovery, they're looking for new sources of value contribution. Actually, top-line revenue contribution coming from the procurement function. So here, again, uh, we've listed uh, some recent benchmark data from the Hackett Group that says that top-performing organizations, for example, have been able to quantify a, a revenue contribution of about set, uh, a little bit over 7% of total revenues that can be attributed to procurement-led supplier innovation. So that's new products that uh, come into the pipeline that drive additional revenue. It's process efficiencies across the supply chain that take cost out. Um, so not, not as clear cut, often more difficult to quantify, but more and more organizations are starting to apply um, those kinds of calculations and quantification metrics to say we're doing more as a function than just driving costs down. We're also collaborating with suppliers to increase the top line. Another metric that's important not to lose sight of, especially as many of the metrics focus on how does procurement get more efficient, actually do more with less, reduce costs, uh, reduce headcount in some cases. Um, supply risk, though, is an area where the, the trend is in the, in the opposite direction, where the, the best performers actually are allocating more headcount to focus on supply risk to avoid supply chain disruptions or brand uh, you know, uh, issues or, or, or any other kind of customer service problems that, that could be very critical. Uh, they're allocating more uh, headcount to supply risk. So, for example, top performers having about 13 FTEs devoted specifically to supply risk versus the bottom quartile, only two. And the other thing that's being measured here by top performing organizations is how are we increasing overall stakeholder satisfaction? So things like a net promoter score to take the temperature of internal customers and stakeholders to see that procurement is doing the right things for the business. So those are just some ways to set the target, understand current baseline performance, set the target, then factoring all that into an overall business case that can pass muster with the financial controller. So they're going to want to see the bottom line. How much spend is under management currently? How much have we increased it? What is the savings capture? And therefore, how can we drive a return on investment? So I'll spare you all the calculations, but you know, being able to create a quantifiable, measurable business case is actually one of the great advantages that procurement has as compared to other functions, things like HR transformation or systems deployment are much more squishy, if you will. Procurement, by its very nature, lends itself to a very hard dollar quantification of the business benefit. So if I'm going to go about this technology transformation, I, I probably can't fight off everything all at once. It's too massive a change across the organization. So the best practice is to say it's not a big bang approach. It's a phase sequencing approach. So I'll borrow from the Gartner Group for their best practices on sequencing procurement solution investments. 
And they, they look at a process that starts with spend visibility, mapping the external spend, getting a clean uh, item master, vendor master, getting granular visibility to what's actually being purchased in which quantities and from whom as a way to inform the overall sourcing strategy and then executing that through, through e-sourcing to drive higher throughput, faster cycle time, uh, and accelerate the overall savings capture. Then they look at step three, if you will, how do I now enforce compliance through a combination of contract life cycle management, uh, you know, supplier management of, or vendor management services, and procure to pay. And of course, the last step, taking that life cycle view to this overall supplier relationship. Uh, rationalizing the supply base, yes, but also with the, the suppliers that I choose to do business with, uh, getting much closer to them, measuring their performance, uh, creating supplier scorecards with key performance indicators specific to that relationship uh, to, to make sure that we're maximizing the value, not just cost reduction from that supplier, but through collaboration, uh, supplier innovation as well. So what are people actually doing in the technology space? This is from our own uh, 2014 Pulse of Procurement study that we conducted at Zykus with over 300 respondents. And we looked at both what technologies had organizations already invested in, and you can see that they kind of follow the advice that I just shared from Gartner with, in starting with spend visibility, for example. That's the highest, almost 70% penetration, uh, followed actually by contract management and then procure to pay. But then we also asked our respondents to tell us, where do you plan to invest in the coming 12 months? And we see much more focus, if you will, on less transactional aspects of technology transformation, things like supplier management or procurement process and performance management going forward. So I want to close with kind of what is the the playbook. The, we've, we've seen the best practice sequencing. I've kind of gone through a methodology for how to identify the value levers and understand baseline performance and set targets to build the business case. Here's a, here's a step one through four cookbook or playbook, if you will, for how to go about the technology transformation. And again, the advice is start with spend. And we can see that the world-class organization as compared to the overall peer group, are more than twice as likely, 89% to 42%, to have a significant amount of spend visibility company-wide. And they're, bear they're bearing the fruits of that visibility in the form of higher savings, higher spend cost reduction as a result of uh, spend visibility and uh, reduced uh, supply base. Through, through supplier rationalization and consolidation. So in taking this step, the next question is, how often do I need to refresh that spend visibility? And uh, for many, far too many organizations, it's been a, you know, a Herculean manual effort simply to produce a spend analysis, and therefore they do it once a year or less frequently. Um, Data here, the pie chart from the Gartner Magic Quadrant, uh, actually shows that, that the top performing organizations, uh, better than three quarters, are refreshing their spend visibility at least quarterly, if not more frequently. So that, that's the target to set. Uh, driving the overall sourcing savings. This comes down to deploying the e-sourcing tools and executing. Here I'll share some data from our own customer base and look at what they're doing with these sourcing tools. Significantly, um, this is to manage the, the overall sourcing process. And actually, uh, these tools are used most frequently for RFPs or RFQs, auctions playing a, a smaller slice, about 12%, uh, where the RFP or RFQ process um, is uh, you know, three quarters of the time. They're getting average savings at 
and cycle time reduction of 17 percent. So clearly benefits to being able to execute on that better spend visibility through sourcing automation. Next comes sustaining those savings. So those are the, that's the compliance tool set consisting of contract management, procure to pay, and supplier management, and a number of benchmarks in this area that say best-in-class organizations shrink the, the contract cycle time, have better visibility, can onboard suppliers faster, reduce the transaction cost in procure to pay, and increase um, the compliance with corporate agreements, reduce maverick spend, and, and do a better job of savings capture. And of course, in the area of supplier management, uh, they, they have more accurate supplier data, only 1% duplicate suppliers for best performers versus, uh, you know, astoundingly almost a third uh, duplicates for the lowest performers. So a number of great metrics to look at how do I justify investment across the technology landscape. And the last one is how do I make sure that I'm getting credit for the savings that are delivered? So financial savings management here Two-thirds of the best-in-class performers, in fact, can track procurement's impact all the way to the financial statements, <clears throat> the income statement, the balance sheet, and cash flow. And they have a better relationship with their counterparts in finance. So on a scale of one to five, best-in-class performers rate the collaboration with finance better than four, 4.35 on a scale of five, and in fact, better than the relationship that procurement has with any other function. So the message is make finance your friend. And the last piece here is deploying, therefore, uh, a financial savings management process and tool set to be able to quantify and document uh, that those savings are actually realized. So here again, some data from Gartner that shows today most organizations are still relying on a cobbled together system of Excel spreadsheets or homegrown tools, and the emerging best practice is to adopt an enterprise level tool set that gives company wide visibility and enables collaboration between procurement and finance to document and approve savings. So, that is the technology transformation playbook. Um, a lot of information to go through in a, in a very short period of time, but uh, so Peter, uh, any any closing thoughts as as you've kind of looked out into the vision of securing the future of procurement, um, how you see technology? Uh, enabling that future as well. Oh, I, I, absolutely, and, and um, I, I think we've run out of time. I, I was going to touch on the people side of things a little bit, um, if we've had sort of questions in that area, um, as to whether, you know, this is all going to need a different sort of person in procurement. And I think the answer is, to some extent, yes, but it's, it's not a total change of focus. But I think one of the things is, it, we don't need every procurement professional to turn into an absolute geeky, techy person, but I, I think everybody, everybody in procurement is going to have to be comfortable with technology um, okay. because technology well, yeah. is going to play a more and more important part. Couldn't agree more, Peter, and, and certainly the trend that we see emerging is that as transactional processes become more okay. automated, and transactional activities are, 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 are deferred to. Okay. I like getting all my stuff kind of quite individual, but you know, a bit different. We're getting some we're getting some interference, Richard. I we think are maybe getting we, maybe, interference. <laughs> maybe we should cl close it down. I think we're almost at the hour, are we? We are. So. So I want to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, clearly, a robust uh, discussion about an important topic. How do we secure the future of procurement? Um, we, I know both Peter and myself would be glad to uh, 
entertain any follow-on questions if anyone wants to reach out to us to uh, delve into any of the topics that we've covered uh, in more depth. And uh, again, thanks to you, Peter. Thanks for all the insights. Uh, great, great vision for the future. And thanks to everyone for attending today. Okay. Thanks.